is uh, our show, Money Means Business, and as we always say, um, business means money. Stability and business mean a lot of money. I'm Nervin Nazim, welcoming you here from uh, uh, Cairo, the microcosm of the whole universe. Um, we have with us our guests tonight who are going to be talking uh, about uh, investment, uh, money, of course, as we always discuss that, but uh, um, recently, actually, like uh, different delegations from different countries have been uh, uh, coming uh, to Egypt uh, uh, talking about investment, seeking investment, signing memoranda of understanding. Uh, we still have a big Korean, South Korean delegation uh, that is uh, um, coming to help in all, uh, to invest in Egypt in all spheres. Um, of technology and uh, infrastructure and other. Uh, tomorrow there will be also uh, a big delegation uh, from the UK visiting Egypt. Uh, we do have with us uh, our guest, Mr. Angus Blair, Egyptian Investment uh, uh, Bank. Thank you, sir, for being with us. We're yeah. honored with your presence. I'm very happy you're back uh, with us again here. And uh, Mr. Uh, Hossam Raouf, International Investment Bank. Thank you, sir, for being you. with us. Uh, we're honored with your presence. Gentlemen, we'll start uh, after a short break. Stay tuned to us. Turn and go. Away. Egypt has uniquely undergone two revolutions in less than three years for better living and the rule of democracy. Egypt remains, after all, as an attractive investment destination despite the difficulties it faced. Ahead of the 2011 revolution, the Egyptian economy was performing well, as confirmed by all KPIs. still here and they're not going anywhere. place to invest first of all because it's a, it's a big market, it's a big local market, it's a good geographical location, you have good people and the costs are competitive. So it's, a, it's a great place, it was, it is and it will be a great place to invest. again uh, the studio and our guests and we have with us again Mr. Hossam Raouf International Investment Bank. Thank you sir again Thank for honor, uh, honoring us with your presence and Mr. Angus Blair uh, Egyptian Investment Bank. Thank you sir again for being with us. So, uh, a lot has been happening lately so what should we start with you know um, uh, let me ask a question everybody asks um, well uh, Britain is a partner in, in, uh, to Egypt in investment through the European Union. Now, uh, with the Brexit, would that affect Egypt somehow uh, with the deals and uh, memoranda or uh, the projects that uh, um, uh, Britain um, you know, uh, is just a uh, um, partner uh, with Egypt in or is just working uh, in Egypt before? Okay, if you, if you look at what's happening, it's, it's a multi-layered question which will take several years to play out. 
if you look at Britain, United Kingdom, yes, is the still the major, in terms of its companies, as a country, the major single investor in terms of the private sector. Yes, uh, and much of that comes from the oil and gas sector, BP. Uh, Shell, which is, uh, took over British Gas, several other smaller oil companies and services, uh, and they account. And oil and gas accounts for about two thirds to three quarters at the moment of foreign direct investment into Egypt. Although that's beginning to change at last, in the in the last year, with a, a coming in from the Gulf in particular, especially the United Arab Emirates. So British companies remain committed in the oil and gas sector, but other sectors are looking, especially construction. No matter what happens with Brexit, that interest in Egypt will be the same, mm -hmm. because these companies have a global view. They look at all of the companies they invest in. That will not change, no matter what happens with Britain and, and Europe. Uh, there will be other issues in time as to the repercussions of Brexit mm -hmm. on the euro or European growth, and of course, there'll be different effects in the body politic of Europe with elections in Germany and France, and to an extent also the strength or weakness, at the moment weakness of the Italian banks, and obviously too right now on, in Greece, and discussions of the IMF and the European Union on support for Greece. But in terms of British support, that will maintain, it'll, I think, still likely to be for quite some time as a country of its constituent companies, the major investor into Egypt, particularly in oil and gas, as I've said, but also branching out with this big delegation that's here this week, mm -hmm. looking at particularly construction, infrastructure, a variety of other areas too. Um, there are other companies, I think, that with Brexit will increase the... Uh, in Egypt, they'll be coming to look at what's happening in the economy as it grows, mm -hmm. as there's some more stability, as new ideas are coming from the government at last, because mm -hmm. it's taken a long time mm -hmm. to focus, really focus on growth. Uh, looking at what can be done in, say, edu education. I think also, I think retail would be a sector, yes. um, pharmaceuticals, and so on. Uh, so it's an exciting time for companies, but they're going to have to, they were here historically, going to come back to Egypt and look at ways in which they can participate in growth. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Hassan, a lot has been happening in the market. Uh, first, before, it, um, uh, as Mr. English Blair said, uh, oh, well, the, the, the idea is coming you know, from the government, you know, finally just presenting something uh, uh, different. Uh, how do you evaluate the government concerning uh, the, the different uh, decisions and the, the last decision, decisions, uh, um, economically speaking, and uh, its performance? Uh, well, uh, bef before I talk about the Egyptian government, I fully agree with Angus regarding the interest in Egypt is going to, to, to remain the same with the BRICS. The, the, I think the, 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 the main impact of the BRICS on Egypt yes. is whether the investment banks, which is the global investment banks, all of them who, who, who actually invest in Egypt are located in the UK. Mm -hmm. So what will happen is whether these investment banks will remain in the UK or move to, to, to Central Europe. This is the question. I think that the interest will remain the same whether this, but it was going to come from a different channel. So if they move to Germany, for example, because of the rights, whether the, the, the European, uh, sorry, the, the international investment banks located in the UK will remain in the UK or will, will move elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But the interest, is, and this is going to affect portfolio investments and not foreign direct investments. Mm -hmm. Regarding the government, I, I mean, honestly, I, I, as a banker, I worked here for 30 years. I have never uh, imagined that I'm going to see a, a successful flotation of the Egyptian pound. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm very happy with the development that the central bank, the steps that has been taken by the central bank of floating the Egyptian pound and actually uh, uh, remain uh, uh, stable even when it touched the 20 pounds. The central bank remained on course. They did not uh, get scared or frightened by, by the high rates. And actually, at the time, take, uh, the, the pound and the dollar uh, pound exchange rate took its time and then stabilized and then started actually to move lower. I expect it to move much lower because now the, there is confidence in the central bank actions. Okay. It's a very, very positive step. But it was a very hard time you know, in the middle because many people were against uh, floating. Uh... Uh, people, I mean, Egyptians, we are, uh, usually we are uh, scared of change. Okay. This is our nature, and, and the change was very aggressive and very in a very short time. So, but uh, alhamdulillah, it was very successful. Mm -hmm. I think the pound will, will continue to, 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 to actually to. But that affect prices because you know, like many people just are now in a uh, kind of like because of these changes, they are. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't call the 29% that has been announced yesterday as inflation. It is, it's a price adjustment. Okay. Because inflation is, is something that uh, 
embedded in the in the economic uh, model and and it happens gradually and it happens over time and then starts to increase gradually but we have one uh, time shift that moved the pound from from 9 to 20 and and the prices actually just moved i don't think this is this 29% will see it again actually it's going to to be less during the next few months and the inflation rate is going to go back to 10 and 11% after this price adjustment stabilized and, and is out of our way. Mm -hmm. So it is just one time that's not going to happen again. And it has been absorbed by the Egyptian people and, and I don't see any um, uh, extreme negative reaction. Mm -hmm. There is a reaction, of course, because okay. it, 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 it's, it's, uh, the price increase was very steep, but, but I think it's stable. Yeah. Uh, or do you agree with that? I think we've discussed this Years ago. Years ago, but you know, one thing I remember right now, you know, uh, I remember that one of the, the callers asked you how much you get, or you know, like the, in dollars or something like mm. that. So you know, like now, you know, like me, if the same caller would call and say, you know, now you know how much is the pound, then how much mm. in dollars or you know, uh, British pounds. <laughs> Uh, I think it's an issue, we've discussed this before, yes. the inflation rate in Egypt, mm -hmm. in all of the time I've looked at Egypt for over 20 years, has been high global norm. Mm -hmm. And I think what we've got to look at, now, uh, perhaps we could, uh, uh, you might want to say something about this, uh, is we've got to look at ways to bring that rate of inflation down. I agree with you that it's, you've got the one-off effects of the, of the hit from the devaluation, but it's, it'll go on for a little bit longer. But it's hurting the poorest in society. So the government obviously is awake mm -hmm. to those challenges to try to ensure that people are protected at the bottom. The IMF has said that too. The social safety net is very important. Yeah. And making sure that people at the bottom are getting fed, are getting support that they need and deserve. But inflation, even if it's 10 or 11%, when the global norm is about 1% to 2%, it's still far too high. So I think that um, to maximize economic growth, we really have to, government really has to bring down inflation. And that's where you've got to look at the structure of the economy, look at ways to break up monopolies, oligopolies, uh, vested interests that perhaps control sections of the economy, and particularly look at food uh, price increases, because they remain much, much higher than the global norm. And President Sisi, I think, uh, he, he understands this, is, and I think is looking at agriculture as one of the key variables to both increase production, mm -hmm. and as the World Bank estimates, around half of all food is spoiled in Egypt, at wastage, and that's where I think you've got to get the private sector involved by improving logistics, mm -hmm. being in cold storage centers everywhere. We now have global uh, food retailers coming in. I can't mention their names, you don't allow me, but they're, they're, they're here in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. They're helping because they're going straight to farmers. Yes. And having chilled uh, distribution centers, as they do in most other countries, would mm -hmm. help. Mm -hmm. But you've really got to have an upgrade in agriculture, and that's where you really need foreign expertise, how to manage water, mm -hmm. utilize it properly, increase the efficiency of agriculture mm -hmm. massively because population growth is there, and help bring down inflation. But the key point here... Uh, from what our friend is saying is the importance of the, the, the free float of the pound. It, was, it came as a big surprise. But there's much more needs to be done now to improve investment. And it's one step mm -hmm. amongst many steps okay. that need to be taken to improve investment. Because global capital is very fluid. It goes anywhere, everywhere in the world. It doesn't have to be here. Mm -hmm. So Egypt still needs to do more to be able to attract that capital. Mm -hmm. It's done a little bit of it in the last few months, and you've mm -hmm. seen that with the success of the bond issue. And much of the per many of the purchases of that bond issue would be UK-based financial institutions. Mm -hmm. And I've seen quite a number of them in the last few weeks. We've now got to build on equity That's where we need privatization. Mm -hmm. We need privatization, and I'd like to see all of the of banks being sold, not just small stakes, sell all of it, so we create new investables in the market. Uh, and look at a variety of other means to be able to revivify the private sector. I've argued, and I think in the last program when we were on together, I'd like to see a cut in the inflation rate. I raised this with the IMF, not inflation rate, the, um, uh, a cut on the corporate and personal tax rates yes. from 22.5%, bring it down to 18%, uh, to, amongst other fiscal measures to be able to boost investment. I'd like to see more creative ways in which uh, Egypt could encourage investment in both specific areas and in specific sectors, as well as just in the Suez Canal zone, because people are in, many of the population are in um, the Nile Valley, and it's, this is where you need to attract a lot of investment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you agree with that? Yeah, I fully agree. That, I mean, Angus mentioned that there is a lot of inefficiencies in the distribution system of food, yes. food products. Yes. And there is a lot of middlemen in, in the process. Yes. I think we need international expertise for sure to be able to manage more efficiently. 
and the prices will go down because when you look at the price of, of uh, food products in the field, it's 10, 20 percent of the price to the consumer. So this 80 percent is gone somewhere. Mm -hmm. Part of it, there is a lot of middlemen, and part of it, there is the, the logistics and, and, and uh, the storage, uh, they are not efficient enough, mm -hmm. and there is a lot of waste in, in between. Mm -hmm. uh, as Angus mentioned, the, the, the major problem in Egypt, the inflation rate, is actually is a function of our fiscal policy. The government here, revenues, every, uh, last year was 680 billion pounds. Actually, the government spent 980 billion pounds. Mm -hmm. When you have this huge deficit, basically what it means, it means that you are in, uh, injecting in the economy 300 billion pounds. Mm -hmm. So the price increase will happen because you are injecting more money than the products you are producing in a, in a very simple term. Yes. And, and, and when, when you inject one third of your budget in, in the economy, there is no way the inflation will go down. So we have to, you have to cut the subsidies. We have to, 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 to actually uh, uh, offer more, more public companies to, 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 to the market and, and basically this will happen, the fiscal policy and then inflation will go down. Yeah, uh, we're also talking about the bonds and you know, like, uh, foreigners you know, buying bonds. What's happening you know, in the treasury market and uh, the bond market? I think, I, I, I think that the, 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 um, the flotation uh, move was very, was very smart. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 it gave confidence to the investor that the, the mindset of the government has changed and, and uh, they are going to play by the international uh, 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 standards. Um, there, is, there is something we call in investment banks the carry play. The carry play is basically when you have two currencies, you, you, you borrow in the currency with the low interest rate, for example, you borrow at 2% and then you invest in another currency at 5%. Even if the exchange rate is stable between the two currencies, you still make three to four percent a year, mm -hmm. and and uh, and and make money. And with the low interest rates in, in the G7, so the carry play is very important mm -hmm. for for the, the 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 mutual fund that invest in fixed in in something that does not really appreciate. I think the carry play in Egypt is the most attractive in the world right now. Mm -hmm. It's number one mm -hmm. because because the interest rate is very high and the pound is appreciating. So you will make an, an interest rate differential of 12 to 13 percent, plus the, the pound is expected to appreciate between 10 to 20 percent at least during the next two months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think I think this this will 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 um, bring a lot of foreign currency to Egypt during the next two months. Hopefully. Um, uh, so you know, I'd you know, like to know um, uh, what are you know, how how to make Egypt more attractive, like, uh, what could it present to the investors to attract them, and what problems do you have here that um, uh, are handicaps to uh, right investments and uh, to, to attract the, the, the right uh, uh, people and investors in order to help you know, with Egypt's development? Well, first, I mentioned to you a few minutes ago yes. the importance of the tax rate. Mm -hmm. If you look at what happened after the last economic crisis from 1999 to 2004, the next government brought it, came in and they cut corporate and personal tax rates in half. Mm -hmm. And you had an instantaneous change in sentiment. The government now doesn't have the same fiscal maneuverability. So we've got to do, I think, is uh, active. You mentioned Brexit earlier. The possibility exists, and I'd say the probability is becoming higher, that after Brexit, you might have a cut, significant cut, mm -hmm. in the British corporate tax rate. Mm -hmm. And Egypt, if it could bring, if the British tax rate, were, the, already the goal was 20%. I think the goal now would be as lower than that, actually. Mm -hmm. you, it would be cut still further. I think Egypt needs to be m much more attractive. Mm -hmm. But you, it's not just the tax rate. It's being able to, in, in doing business here, the continuing obligations. And it's still, when you look at all of the global metrics that come from the World Bank and other agencies, that this isn't the easiest market within which to operate. Mm -hmm. And it's not like the Emirates. The, in the Emirates, they like to say yes rather than no. And in Egypt, sometimes the answer is, we'll think about it. Well, well there isn't enough time. There's, mm -hmm. there's, as I said, people d can't wait around for an answer. So I think that, I think also I'd like to see some new thinking. And, I'm, and if I want to give a recommendation, mm -hmm. uh, we can't create a new Egypt until we have better education. Mm -hmm. So you need to focus on improving education for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you look at what's happening in the world, and we saw this at the World Economic Forum only a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. looking at the importance now, increasing importance of artificial intelligence in uh, almost all sectors. Here it's almost non-existent. But 
you can't be away from the rest of the world when the rest of the world is looking at investing in high tech and AI course. and alternative energy. This is a country that's constantly sunny. We should be having solar energy panels on top of every building. We should be creating alternative energy projects all over. Um, so I, I would look at how to make that much more easy mm -hmm. and cheaper. I would look at how to improve education and use, try to find different means to be able to do it as cheaply as possible, as effectively as possible, because Egyptian children deserve it. Mm -hmm. I see enormous talent here, fantastically good talent, amongst the best in the region, I think, of people who are willing uh, to work hard if they have the natural tools, and education is the key tool to create effective change. Mm -hmm. And then look at ways to embrace high-tech and artificial intelligence, because mm -hmm. at the moment people are perhaps scared of it in certain areas. They shouldn't. It's really going to help the economy. I think these are some measures I think I would like to see uh, and focusing on helping as many people as possible using technology um, in across the country, not just focus on the cities. And I think there are many companies out there globally that would be willing to help do that if mm -hmm. Egypt's open to uh, uh, bring in and encourage that investment to come into Egypt. Mm -hmm. Just some solutions in all of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you see that, sir? Uh, I, I think there is, there, is, there, is, there is a lot of projects that's happening in Egypt and right now there is uh, in the parliament they are discussing the, the offering the Egyptian passport for one million dollars if you invest one million dollar or more mm -hmm. and uh, there is another law that is uh, uh, how would that interest uh, uh, investors would it make their life easier investing in Egypt or just you know um... I think it, it first of all when you look at the region here most most of the really the wealthy uh, uh, Arabs and and, and um, influential people are, has been has been educating in Egypt. Yes, they look at Egyptian TV, they look at uh, they read Egyptian novels and and they hear Egyptian music. So, I mean, the 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 the, 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 the these people they, they deserve in some way that that if they want to invest money in Egypt, they can own the passport yes. because they are. It, their culture is Egyptian. I don't think there is there is there is only one culture in the region, which is the Egyptian mm -hmm. culture, mm -hmm. and and there is different countries and yes. different uh, nationalities. But it is only one culture. Yes. I think these people they deserve to have the right to invest here. They they can invest without having the passport. But when you tell them you can have the passport, mm -hmm. it's an indication that you are accepting them. Mm -hmm. And they are not going to be, for example, nationalized. They are not going to be, nothing is going yeah. to happen like what happened here during the 60s. It makes them more, feel more secure and... Uh, more... Uh, uh, allegiance, you know, more... Welcomed, to, oh, more okay, welcomed. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and th there was an episode in, in Egypt history, which is 1965 to 1970, which is very, very negative. Mm -hmm. And we have been suffering from this uh, era until now. Yes. Uh, so the Egyptian passport is very important to, to give them, to, to, they feel welcome. This is one thing. The second law, which is very important, I think much more important than the investment law, mm -hmm. is the labor law. Okay. The labor law is being discussed in the parliament now. One of the biggest problems in Egypt is that you cannot fire people. So companies here, they take a huge risk when, when, when they open a new business that they are going to be stuck with the, with the employees for years. Yeah. I think when, when, when they put some measures where, where companies under certain conditions can fire people, I think it's going to change the culture. The work culture is going to change very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hope these two laws pass. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, there are problems, you know, with uh, trained, uh, I think, you know, uh, workers. So uh, we, we do have that in Egypt. Of course, but but I mean, I mean, if, even if you are going to invest in training people, and and then you cannot fire them, I think one of the reasons mm -hmm. the UK has been successful in attracting the international banks is the labour laws. I think it's really very important because in in, in Central Europe. There is this socialist mentality with regarding to, to the labor law, and it is uh, it's structured in a way that, that, that the, 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 the staff, the employees, has more rights than the companies. Mm -hmm. I think the UK is different. And I, I remember working for an American bank, and one of the reasons when we were relocating our uh, training uh, uh, staff from, from Paris and Frankfurt to London, that was, was the, one of the major uh, uh, attractions mm -hmm. to moving them to London. So I think if this law passes, it's, it's being discussed now in the parliament. I just met a, a parliament member and he told me it is going to pass. If this law passes, it's going to change our future, I'm sure. Would it then create disgruntlement from people again working? Because you know, like everything, as you said, you didn't want I think something it, like this would not make them feel uh, secure. It doesn't matter, but it will make companies more 
more, uh, they will have more courage to hire people very quickly because they know if things doesn't go well, they will be able to, to restructure their business mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and scale it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to improve the, the, the unemployment rate. It's not going to, to hurt it as people think. Exactly like what, when they thought of the, of, the, of the flotation, there was yeah. a lot of fears about that. The, you know, the international investors, the fund managers, they're going to take the pound to, to, to the dollar to 2,000 and the, the yeah. economy is going to, to, to collapse. And all this has been proven wrong. Yeah. Actually, it reached an extreme price and then moved to the right, and it's moving towards the right price in a, in a very gradual and organized way. But so I think- But will still be floating, you know, like we say, you know, like when you traveled in the currency, you know, you can, you, every day the dollar has a different rate. Would it be like that or you know, like uh, would, would reach you know, something uh, stable? I think it will stabilize at a certain rate, like all the currencies. But, the, but when you think of, of a currency that, if, for example, if it moves 50 pesters up or down during a day, that doesn't mean much. When, when regarding your trade flows, and it doesn't really affect. Mm -hmm. The problem when it moves 20%, 30% in one month or two months, this hurts yeah. the trade flow because uh, the, the companies uh, exporting or importing, they will not be able to, to, to budget mm -hmm. their, their next few months in, a, in an organized way. But I think what's happening now is very clear. The pound is moving very slowly, mm -hmm. uh, appreciating very slowly towards the equilibrium level. Okay. And I think it's going to reach it during the no next month or two. And it's going to stabilize for, for a long time at that level. Okay. Uh, concerning the labor law you know, that uh, uh, Mr. Rauf you know, mentioned, do you think you know, that this would be an attraction uh, well, in the, in the investment, you know, for the investors you know, coming into Egypt? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a whole picture. There are many levels yes. which create an attractive environment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the overall size of the market. Egypt's a huge market for a diversified economy. So naturally, it attracts a lot of interest. Mm -hmm. And we see that with private equity deals, which you know, mm -hmm. significant portion of all of private equity in the whole region, yes. much of it's in Egypt. But it's more than that. I mean, if you look at the passporting, that's where I might disagree with you on the passporting, because in Europe, it's easier to get a visa um, for much less capital. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, that's a sort of red herring uh, to attract people, although I can see where you're coming from. Uh, I think making visas easier for foreign investors and longer term I mean, I have to get one every six months. It would really help if I was able to get a longer term visa, not just me, anyone else, frankly, make it easier. Once, because I've already passed, I think, some of the, um, uh, the areas in which people are, are ready when you come in and have the experience, you come into a marketplace. So I would make getting visas easier, getting permissions easier and quicker mm -hmm. in the system here. That would be really good. Because again, if you go in the Emirates, you'll get an answer sometimes within days. Yeah or anywhere else. That's the way it should be here. You shouldn't have to wait months or some years. But you said what you're looking for is just a whole change of the frame of mind actually and... Uh, uh, well, there you are. You just yes. mentioned it. it's mm -hmm. the change of the mindset mm -hmm. as to what should happen. Mm -hmm. And that's where I have to say I still remain a skeptic. And it's a healthy skeptic because you know, and you know, I want to see a very healthy economic Egypt. Yes. I'm an investor here. Uh, so I want to make it work. But you've got to change the mindset to say mm -hmm. change is good not stability. I mean, I, I think we shouldn't confuse the word stability because currency, if you have a free-floating currency, yeah. is going to move up and down. We're going to have to get used to it. But if, we, if Egypt and the authorities get things right, mm -hmm. then the, the pound might strengthen. But there's still lots that need to be done first for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, you've got to help the population that's hurting. Mm -hmm. So you've, there's much more that needs to be done. And I think one of the mistakes that the government had at the time of the um, devaluation and free float was everyone was waiting for a oh, good, like, where's the investment law, where's the bankruptcy law, where's the, where are the, all the other laws? They waited lo a long time. Yeah. So it'd be good to see in a short space of time new laws coming in, one after the other. We've been waiting for that for uh, some time. Privatise yeah. the bank, don't just do a small bit, privatise the whole bank. Yes. Create a new investable in the stock market. That will create enormous liquidity in the stock market, bring in foreign interest. Uh, and, list, and list on the stock market other larger state enterprises mm -hmm. that would help effect change. Are there you've any seen indications the that they just you know, do comprehend uh, what you're saying? And yes, I mean, I did it. I got a personal example. When I did the Global Depository <laughs> Receipt for CIB in 1996, okay. and that was done with some resistance internally, but it was a huge success. Mm -hmm. And it was seen that, therefore, you created this big private sector investment bank. That alone till it shows you the example of what works. Mm -hmm. A good private sector bank that matches any peer in the region, that's very well respected outside by global investors. And you've got a stock market, it's the bellwether stock, but it shouldn't be the only one. Mm 
We should have a number of big stocks in the market. So I would, I would really hope that the authorities focus on full privatization, liberalizing laws, making things easier, and be willing to say yes, rather than say, well, as I mentioned earlier, we'll think about it. Mm -hmm. I think that would really help get economic growth up to the levels we saw in about 2007, when it reached a peak of over 7% per annum. We need to get to those levels quickly, because with population growth of about 2.5%, or just over, you really need to get to those levels. And in fact, you've got to get, I think, get up to double figures. It's doable with the right policies because household sector debt and private sector debt are very, very low. In a world that's full of debt, Egypt's a paragon of virtue, at least in the private sector and household sector. It's that enormous liquidity really helps when you put the policies right, you have strong economic growth. And that's what I'd like to see. Mm -hmm. Is the government uh, um, that bold to take you know, like, uh, steps like that? It's been taking like floating uh, the pump, but still, you know, um, are they afraid of just having, uh, taking um, very um, courageous actually steps like that? I think it's about control, losing control. The idea of, of losing control is, is, is scary. Unattractive here. Uh, no, it is scary. I mean, you don't yes. know if you lose, like the pound, the, the, I mean, there was a lot of, of talks about what will happen and, the, and there will be. Uh, uh, collapse of the pound and, yes, and, yes. and actually we succeeded big time. Yes. I think that the issue, I, I understand from where Angus is coming from, he, he, he actually invested in a lot of national markets. Mm -hmm. But when you look at Egypt during the 60s and 70s, yeah. I'm living in a dream now. I don't believe these things are happening. I mean, I mean because, because during the 60s, there, that was a very uh, black period in the economic development of Egypt. In, in, by all measures, and, and the government was doing all the wrong things in all directions. I mean, it was, it was I, I, when, I, when I look, there was nothing, not one right decisions being taken. Mm -hmm. During the 70s, there was an attempt by the government to, to, to correct the path. Yani, Dr. Kaisouni, the, the very famous Egyptian economist, he tried in 1977 to, to correct the subsidy issue, mm -hmm. and there was a backlash from the, from the, from the population at that time, and, and actually, the 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 the, uh, the movement the the street movement during that time actually uh, put us you know back 50 years mm -hmm. because the the, the decision making process the economic decision making process became obsessed haunted by the idea if I increase the price then there will be a, a, a uprising a street uprising there will be there will be a, um, you know, backlash from the public, from the public people. So, so, so. Now I think we are overcoming this for the first time. Mm -hmm. I think the government is moving quickly. I mean, raising the, the fuel prices, they're moving the fear that 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 has been haunting us from 1977. If do, do you know what I'm talking about, Dr. Kaisuni move, uh, and this fear that has been created during these two days is starting actually. To, to, uh, to go away. Yeah. And now the government is more courageous taking steps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this in itself, the, the idea of seeing this is happening, I think the, 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 the slow process that has been happening because of, the, of, the, um, of these two mm -hmm. terrible days in our history is gone. I, yes. think, I think things will, will start moving very quickly during the next two to three months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But only the, the, the reason Egypt was not moving is as quickly as people uh, 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 wanted to move, because, simply because of these two days. Yes, yes. It's one event yeah. that actually, actually affected our, the last 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. I think this, the, 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 the people now are accepting that the fuel prices will go by one pound and then that nothing happened. Then, then the government will move to another direction. Then uh, the, the flotation and then there was this uh, almost 30% increase in two to three months, and there was no reaction. Then the government will start taking economic decisions that are based on 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 logical thinking of of of, uh, of Egypt future, of, mm -hmm. of what is best for Egypt future, not what actually will will be accepted by the population, mm -hmm. which is a very different. Yani, yani, the the way the decision making process during the last 30 or 40 years has been haunted by doing something that will 
cause mm -hmm. cause any uh, problems in the streets. Yes, but then you know uh, we talked before you know, like uh, all the events that happened and uh, the revolutions, all that or uh, uprisings. Um, you know, we were just talking like uh, there were reforms by uh, Mubarak's uh, governments, and people also you know were complaining they could not feel you know they said okay this good this goes fine, but we're not feeling you know like anything concrete and we're not getting better. Where is you know like the outcome? Um, did you think you know for the since we haven't yeah. met all that time you know uh, how do you see the whole picture from that time? Did you imagine anything happening uh, in Egypt like that? Did we, did we hit rock bottom? And I would know? disagree, Nermeen, about that because there are enough metrics to show what happened after 2004. Yes. That GDP growth was rising. Obviously, for some, I mean, people are in the middle of the delta or areas of Upper Egypt wouldn't have felt change immediately, but it was changing. Mm -hmm. If I saw Egypt when I first came here in the early 90s, to um, the mid 2000s was enormous change. Yes. And it's not, I'm not talking of real estate change that you see in the Gulf, it's all a facade mm -hmm. of lo uh, many new buildings, but the substance not really changing. Mm -hmm. But clearly, with population growth as it is, the real effect was more difficult to do because you had to then increase economic growth still further. But, and, and it takes time. Mm -hmm. There's always a time, there's, when you make a change, it's a bit like in any company or even in a TV station, you, you, ha you want to change, you create a new set, you create a new programming, you create a new, new strategy, it takes time to feed through to get new customers. Mm -hmm. And that was the, it's the same in Egypt. Where it went wrong was how people took advantage of those changes mm -hmm. that people saw. Mm -hmm. I think that was a key issue, which we don't really need to go into at the moment, because otherwise we'll end up getting into trouble. But, <laughs> well, and going digressing, which yeah. we don't want to mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, the fact is that there was significant change mm -hmm. and the legacy of those changes mm -hmm. we still feel now. Mm -hmm. And it's why, for example, there's a very large company from the Emirates that's building shopping malls mm -hmm. that decided only just over a year ago to increase its investment from one and a half billion dollars, creating new shopping malls, to three billion dollars. Mm -hmm. It's an enormous investment just from one company in a sector that's really required. I disagree with, even I think in one of your programs historically, I disagree with someone about the importance of shopping malls mm -hmm. and new entrants into the retail scene. Mm -hmm. It creates lots of new jobs. You can then see yeah. visibly, most tangibly, mm -hmm. uh, that there's people that are spending. Yes. And it's why, for example, yes. you can have a global supermarket chain here that has more sales per square meter here mm -hmm. than their store in Dubai. Of course. This is a real market, and these shopping mall malls help attract change, effect change by people. You take visit visitors from outside, and you'll see when a big one opens in March in, by Dreamland outside the west of Cairo. That will effect change. But I know what you mean. It does take time mm -hmm. for the benefits to go through to people in the street. And it always is mm -hmm. going to be take time. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm in favour, if you learn from the 1930s economic programme of in America, and I, in my first degree I did economics and earth science too, earth and environmental science. But in economic history in America in the 1930s, what really worked was getting people back to uh, work near where they lived. Mm -hmm. There was only one big project at the time in America, that was the Hoover Dam. So you had people building dams, mm -hmm. small dams. You had people building roads, houses, yeah. post offices, mm -hmm. schools, mm -hmm. many of which still exist and are used now. Yes. yes. And I think that that's where I think the government really should think about how we get smaller projects across the country to show people that we care about you, we're making change where you live. I think that should be a priority too. Mm -hmm. Uh, rather than just big projects. And I think that mm -hmm. there's a lesson to be learned from what didn't work mm -hmm. in the mid-2000, um, mid from 2004 to 20, 2010, uh, but what you, the lessons from elsewhere and how to incorporate those into the current strategy for the economy of the country, mm -hmm. because it would help. People have to see that there's change where they live. Mm -hmm. So that should be a part of, I think, any key part of the government policy, that should be there. Mm -hmm. How do you see that? Oh, I, I fully agree with Angus. I mean, the, I mean, urban planning in Egypt is, is just. Uh, I mean, I mean, the malls, the malls. As an Egyptian living in Cairo, I think, the the, the for me, a mall is very important because pe yeah. you people used to to, to to tear down and break down villas and, and build you know this small, mm. unorganized malls and and chops in, in in an area where they're surrounded by villas and it's going ruining the life the the the, 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 the urban life of, of mm -hmm. this small communities i think the malls will this at least will stop so so this the malls in itself will help the urban planning that at least this trend 
of, of actually historical sites are being destroyed every every day and, and building historical sites. It's no. a shame, yeah. We see yeah, like a lot I, of I that. Don't know. I mean, this yeah. at least will be will be gone. I mean, there I, was a law, you know, uh, prohibiting actually like bringing down. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm living in Heliopolis, and yeah, know, and know, every I week I see I see one yeah. of the most beautiful buildings in the world. Yes, because yes. I lived everywhere. Yes. I lived in the states. I lived in Europe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm most beautiful buildings in the world is being broken down and, and then you have an ugly, ugly exactly. building or a, or a very small shopping mall that's in the middle of 10, 20 villas. I mean, the culture uh, of ugliness you know, that so, is prevailing, which is really bad and should be really... Uh, um, so I think the malls start. will help in that regard. Yeah. But, but of course, I fully agree with Angus. I mean, I mean the government should... should have, the urban planning should take a, a, a major uh, uh, importance in, in their planning and, and part of the urban planning will be how to create jobs in these small communities, mm -hmm. not most of the jobs are being created in Cairo and Alexandria. Yes. One, I other fully agree. New, one other new idea. I'd love to see a startup office for new startups um, to help young talent as well as business, young uh, people setting up small mm -hmm. businesses. I'd love to see startup centers set up all over the country yes. to help people how to, how to uh, have a business plan, yeah. how to attract capital, how to look for advice uh, and look for ways. I have one idea which I'm presenting to one government. but. Uh, how we can do that across Egypt. Yes. Because we need to focus on a nurturing talent. Yes. Because Definitely. some people can have a great idea that even if they don't have they formal don't education, can still do, they can yeah, still do exactly. it, that they can do it. Mm -hmm. There's lots of talent in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's a, it would be such a shame for Egypt if that you could have somebody who could be the world's best entrepreneur, who may not have the best education, but has a great idea, if they could find a way to make it come to fruition, would be superb. Mm -hmm. And not just in Cairo or Alexandria, but in Mahala or Zagazig or exactly. um, Manuf, mm -hmm. anywhere in the startup centers all over the country. I think we, that would be a good idea if the government did that. Yes, um, you know, uh, talking about the, the lot of, of investment, you know, just came to my mind, like doing, uh, what is just, you know, keeping it from, we talked about before, you know, the one-stop shop and you know, like, you know, Dubai and all, you know, they, they do, you know, like they have, they're faster in taking decisions here. It's it's taking some time. We've been talking since, you know, even Sharmi uh, a conference a summit, you know, and things are just, you know, trailing. Uh, what is, uh, what is it expected to, if you think, you know, uh, do you know anything about it? Uh, I think you know? uh, Angus has mentioned the mindset. The mindset is our biggest problem. Mm -hmm. And the mindset here in the sense that um, um, not all business people are coming to harm the, the, the country. Not all foreigners are coming to, to do something bad. Not yes. all. This yes. small uh, ideas yes. that, that is embedded in our in thinking, mouth, exactly. and this is what was preventing. But mm -hmm. I mean, people, they, they should know that well, they are after making money, but also they are patriots in, in the way they want the country to improve. They are not against the country. Of course. Mm -hmm. And making money does not conflict with, with helping the society. Mm -hmm. They both can go hand in hand and actually improve the whole society. And yes. part of making money, the, part of this money will go back to the society mm -hmm. in some form, in either consumption mm -hmm. or charities or creating new jobs. So, so this mindset needs to change. Mm -hmm. But this is, this is, of course, it takes uh, it's, it's, time. A, it's a long process. And, and uh, it's actually back to the 60s. Yes. Everything here is back to the 60s. This mindset was, was created in the 60s, and the nationalization mm -hmm. happened because the mm -hmm. business people are using the, the, the population and, and actually they don't have the right to, to own this money while the half percent society and all this uh, uh, logos of the 60s and, and they are still there. Mm -hmm. We need to move, I mean, away from, from this type of thinking and, and actually really welcome investors. Yes. And one of your earliest comments, Noreen, you mentioned the fact the Korean delegation was here yes. and right here from mm -hmm. tomorrow mm -hmm. uh, for a few days there's a British delegation here yes. in a variety of sectors and it shows you that they, they wouldn't be here if there wasn't, this wasn't an attractive That's market. Yeah. And I think that I'd like to see more diversification of these uh, trade missions, because there's a lot of talent in Britain, and then the services, the creative services particularly. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see people coming from media here, mm -hmm. uh, music and uh, film and TV this is even and advertising. Culture, yeah, yeah. It's got and, and theatre. Yes. Uh, uh, to come here, mm -hmm. as well as because everyone, it's still quite traditional in terms of oil and gas and construction, but that's fine. I'm not yeah, criticizing yeah. it, but I'd love to see more diversification. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think that Egypt needs to work in the overall, not just a message, because it isn't just a message, because mm -hmm. Egypt does great presentations, it's a great negotiator, but you need more on the substance. You've got to, people have got to, they can, they can see the presentation, then they'll say, okay, but what about this? What's happening behind the scenes? What's happening about making life easy? Can we do one thing or another? And I think that 
I, um, but what those delegations are, are doing is there's tangible interest mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. in Egypt. Now, they've had trade delegations since 2011, mm -hmm. uh, but not as many as before. And now they're increasing in the last few months. And I think that it's good for Egypt. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're talking about is they've got to be made and make it clear, much more welcome. Not just in a narrow band of the few people they're seeing, but yes. across ev every sector of governance here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh well, inviting me or like a theater and uh, films, or what is preventing um, that from happening? Is it you know, it's the, the rules, no, I mean, it's, it's okay. easy. It's why people go and film companies, and yes. Britain is a major center in film production. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Many of the world's major films and mm -hmm. series, usually many series, are built, are made in Britain yes. with great talent. Mm -hmm. Uh, they go to Morocco in yes, the region true, true. because it's easy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it's it, because you have the sunshine. But the Moroccans have made it really easy. Mm -hmm. In Egypt, that's not the case. It's one condition after another. It's who can work, where can they work, masses of pa bits of paperwork. The Moroccans have just made it easy. Yes. So it goes back to what we said earlier: make it easy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, make and Egypt people would reachable come. to others, you know, who just cannot reach it this way, whether investors or uh, art. Uh, well, it's just a hassle. Artists. People would rather go where it's easier. If you want somewhere that's sunny, they'll go to Morocco or Malta mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and now there's a centre being set up in Abu Dhabi for films. Mm -hmm. So I would like to see, as I keep going about it, cut the bureaucracy, cut through the hassle mm -hmm. of being able to do anything. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be like that. Mm -hmm. So I think that would help attract yes. services. Because Egypt, historically, when I watched films in the 1940s and 50s, they were, were in terms of quality mm -hmm. on a par with what was happening in Hollywood or London. And that, some of that talent's been lost, the quality particularly, with the respect to Egyptian films. And I think that certainly the breadth mm -hmm. uh, has been lost. And I'd like to see, uh, as I said, find different ways to make it easier. Each, there's no reason why Dubai or Beirut should be the centre of advertising in yes. the MENA region. Yes. It could be here. There's mm -hmm. great talent. Mm -hmm. Uh, find ways to make it easier mm -hmm. uh, for the creative businesses to be here, mm -hmm. set up more uh, our arts centres in the universities that mm -hmm. do better graphic design, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. do better advertising degrees and so on. Mm -hmm. So these are ways in which I think I could recommend some changes, but all of it goes back to the bureaucracy and being able to make life easier for people who want to come in. Mm -hmm. And the other final thing I want to mention on services, one thing I think that the authorities don't grasp is that setting up a new company could just be a, someone sitting here on a table with a laptop. Mm. You don't have to have an industrial company. Mm -hmm. And that goes again with the mindset, is that in this new world we are already in, it's not uh, that it will happen in the future, we've already been in it, that we've got to look for encourage service companies mm -hmm. uh, particularly. We haven't looked at that, we haven't really discussed it. But uh, that's some way I think we have to look at how we can encourage service companies to come into Egypt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, a question like how to attract you know, like, uh, British tourists here to Egypt. Uh, you know, with the, with the, uh, we do have an advertisement or let's say you know, mm -hmm. uh, projecting a negative picture of what's happening here, talking about uh, uh, terrorism and with you know, like blowing up in out of proportion one event or let's say an accident happening and then you know just you hear uh, dangerous. It's happening everywhere and now. Yet you know Egypt is like focused on? There's not a negative picture in Britain. I don't mm -hmm. see it mm -hmm. in the media. I mean, t t people think there is, but there actually there isn't. Mm -hmm. There are reasons why, for example, Sharm el-Sheikh has been off limits, but there have been huge improvements in Sharm el-Sheikh. Mm -hmm. And in fact, only yesterday, there was a formal, or day before yesterday, for, uh, formal, yesterday, formal announcement from Sweden, Norway, Denmark and Finland yes. to allow direct flights back to Sharm el-Sheikh. Mm -hmm. That will automatically increase the capacity of flights to Sharm el-Sheikh and I think will help encourage other company, uh, countries to do, change their travel advice. And I think that will probably come in the short term, not the long term, in the short term. Mm -hmm. And that will boost uh, visitors to Sharm. Mm -hmm. But I was in Luxor last weekend, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. It was full of Egyptian tourists on holiday, but p every site was packed. But the downside was you can't get tourists to go to Luxor if there isn't airline capacity. Yes. And that's where we've got to encourage the airlines to fly, first of all, mm -hmm. and have airplanes of the right size for people who want to come. Mm -hmm. An example being, say, my, in my own country, the, if you go to London, there's only Egypt, uh, uh, can, I, I can mention the companies, two airlines <laughs> that fly to, uh, to London. Mm -hmm. the, the plane size of the, the, of the British example is small, yeah. but 
therefore the people who are able to come mm. are minimized because mm -hmm. of the size of planes and the yes. capacity in terms of the schedule yes. only one flight a day yes so i think that would help if there's more um, competition or more flights more frequent flights that would definitely help mm -hmm. tourism will recover i've got if I was at, when I was at the, the museum in Tahrir Square three weeks ago yesterday, it was the busiest I've seen it since 2010. Mm -hmm. And the majority of people there were Chinese. Mm -hmm. And that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. There's a diversification of the people who want to come to Egypt, mm -hmm. but they were there in the museum. Uh, I think it will be great when the, national, the big new museum opens up by the pyramids. Um, I think that's going to be fantastic too. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I said to you, I'd love to have, before we came on air, I'd love to do one of these from the new museum yes. to show and help showcase before it's even open what it's like mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to talk about what the issues are about investment and how to attract people and part of that is tourism. Yes. There are sites obviously in Egypt that are not, there's nothing like them anywhere else in the world and I think they need to be better taken care of, yeah. one of the things I saw in Lockshaw for example, um, and ways in which they can be presented to the world in the museum. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another way to add services to Egypt is to how to maximise the tourist experience. Mm -hmm. Because right now when you come, it's not a brilliant experience for the tourist outside getting some sunshine. It's to getting people to spend money when they're here. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think some foreign companies might be able to help too. It's how to maximise tourism revenue when people are actually here. Yes. Uh, one final word. How do you see like um, the future? I wouldn't say you know, like or like, you know, the near future, you know? I'm very, very optimistic. I'm very optimistic about um, what's happening in the deregulation of the banking sector. I'm yes. very optimistic about the new parliament that is being targeted by all the Egyptians on daily basis. Mm -hmm. I think they are doing a great job. Yeah, they've been targeted, actually. You know, like, everything is like... Every, every, I mean, yes. and actually, the negative sentiment that mm. is, that is uh, be becoming like our daily routine mm. is totally wrong. Mm -hmm. Egypt is moving in a, a, not as quickly as I wish, but moving at a steady pace. And I think we are going to see a different Egypt in two, three years' time. This is going to be a great country. I think the economic development will happen. The new laws that are being discussed in the parliament, if they pass, mm -hmm. I think it's going to change our future. I'm very optimistic. I hope too, you know, that just, you know, take uh, steps in punishing whoever just destroys our, uh, well, uh, historical buildings and important buildings, because this is, you know, we had a loss for that. I don't know why now, you know, they leave it like this. Uh, that's really... Uh, yeah, I, I, this is for me, I'm, I'm from Heliopolis, I, uh, and I have been raised in Heliopolis, and for me, uh, this is... Uh, it's so sad. Yeah, it is very, for me, it's very that I'm yes. seeing all these buildings that I have seen when I was young and they are being uh, demolished. Well, the same thing in Alexandria. Uh, during the 25th of January, they're destroying and building you know, very uh, ugly buildings in Komedeka. You know, the, uh, not Komedeka, uh, uh, Kafra Abdu. You know, yeah, Kafra Abdu is ruined. Yes, well, yes well, the, the villas, best. all yeah. the historic villas, you know, all that. Uh, yes. Uh, unfortunately. Uh, Mr. Hossein Rauf, thank you very much thank you. for being with us. You're honored us with the President, Mr. Angus, but thank you very much thank for you. being here. As for our viewers, thank you for being there. We'll see you again next week. I'm Nermin Azim signing off. Goodbye for now.